Do you suffer from poor podcasts? Wish you could find a podcast that wasn't boring, but didn't bombard you with vulgarity or get into the latest politics? Want a podcast that's actually from lifelong gamers and not just personalities? Introducing the Multiplayer Gaming Podcast. Side effects may include actually enjoying your podcast, learning about awesome games you may have missed, gaming news, fun game reviews, and laughter. If you experience lightheadedness, dizziness, or nausea, please continue to listen anyway as we assure you it'll be worth it. Oh, and check out MultiplayerSquad.com to get bonus episodes, early access, ad-free episodes, exclusive Discord perks, giveaways, basically everything cool. Check it out to get everything cool. Now on to the show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Multiplayer Gaming Podcast. On Thursdays, we cover This Week in Gaming, and we have chosen a few news stories this week that should be a blast to talk about. Please make sure to rate our show five stars in your podcasting app and leave a written review if you are on Apple Podcasts. Also, if you want to help support our show and get bonus episodes, you can check out our Patreon page where support starts at five bucks a month. Just visit MultiplayerSquad.com. I am your host, Paul, and I am joined, as always, by my two fellow gamer dads. Coming up first, he's been wandering around five regions to defeat his enemies and indoctrinate his new cult followers... It's Josh. Ooh, I kind of like the way. Uh, now, uh, this I know where you're going with this, Paul, and you can't butter uh-huh. me up by uh, by you know making me sound like a uh, a warlord with my followers and stuff. But I, I think I think even despite your buttering, we're gonna have disagreements here soon. Uh, yeah, yeah, we we've discussed that one a little bit off air, and uh, you know, also with us, he is ninety nine point nine eight percent off. He's on sale for only six cents, guys. It's Michael. I think you're saying that I'm ninety nine point nine eight percent air quotes off because I'm not all there sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, roguelikes, you scare still, me. Still uh, it's too funny. pricey I, for my blood. Right, hey, whoa, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. No, I. It's funny. Speaking of. Uh, uh, all these episodes or all these episodes wow words are hard today can we just start the show over let's just let's just hit the reset no way man we're just gonna sit here and watch you continue to stumble michael no no mulligans (laughs) like the whole episode is 40 minutes of me just trying to dig myself out of this like verbal blah jenga that i put myself in anyways i was wondering how you're going to introduce me because the rest of these stories are not positive ones and i'm like well i'm just left with whatever we got left <laughs> yep yep i thought about saying that your brain is 99.98 percent off but that's uh, what i was saying yeah, also, yeah that's kind of where you took it. it so wait a minute me being introduced as a cult leader is considered a positive thing it's the best thing so far. Okay. <laughs> yeah you, you'll see it's coming okay. it's coming guys right, you'll just see. making sure <laughs> you make more money as the leader but it's more fun as a follower as creed would tell us from the office All right, well, let's jump in, guys. We have hand-selected a couple of news stories this week that we thought would be fun to talk about, and let's start off by talking about what is probably the biggest surprise hit of the summer, Cult of the Lamb. It is a roguelike game that just released a little over a week ago. It has already sold over a million copies. GameSpot rated it a 9 out of 10. Kotaku actually wrote an article headlined that Cult of the Lamb is the latest game of the year contender. Now, as you guys might remember, this was actually on my radar. I brought this up, I think it was in a Squadcast episode when we were talking about upcoming releases in August. But none of us picked up this game. We did not have any plans to deep dive it or anything like that. And this game kind of snuck in a little bit under the radar, huh? I think that uh, I have selective hearing sometimes in that I don't remember you talking about this at all. <laughs> and so um, the funniest <laughs> thing is I was thinking about that as we were looking at these. I thought about this last week, too. When, you know, Twitter went crazy. It went nuts. Like, you got to play Cult of the Lamb. It's amazing. And all, all I thought the whole time was we just got off Wasteland 3 a little bit ago, and I was watching the Blood of the Lamb over and over again through that remake of that song. And I'm like, yeah. Blood of the Lamb, Cult of the Lamb. But... That was all that I thought of it. I really hadn't had this on my radar at all. And I was thinking we should have done a deep dive on this, but I feel like nobody saw this coming. I feel like it looks, I mean, I, I'm looking at images right now and screenshots like you've all seen. It looks stupid. I don't want to play this game. It looks dumb. <laughs> yeah. my. I, I would just like to say, we were arguing, just so everybody knows, we were arguing about this game before we hit record. And so my impression of Cult of the Lamb is blah. 
<laughs> I know, like Paul and I were arguing. Paul's like, man, we probably should have picked this up. This game looks like it's right up your alley, Josh. I said, no way. You quit trying to push your Stardew Valley and Animal Crossing type games on me. <laughs> Paul, wait, Nothing you're nuts. Nothing to do with either of those You games. love Hades, and this is like a Hades type game. It's a roguelite. And I said, yeah, quit trying to push your games on me, Paul. And then we we started recording. So that's basically where we were at with this. I you know I watched the reviews. Paul got me all interested in it. And I thought, well, man, maybe we missed a really fun game. And I've actually been hungry for a different type of game lately. Um, we've been playing a lot of RPGs. So, you know, that's we why we that did. Out. That's why we did Bro Force and stuff like that. So I was like, ooh, let me look at this game. And I started watching the review. And it's like, I don't want to play this game. This doesn't look fun to me. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm kind of the opposite at this point. Like, I know that I was like, I don't want to play this game, but just because everyone's so amped about it, I really kind of do want to play the game now. Yeah, it's funny to me that Josh jumped straight into Neon White, which looks absolutely <laughs> bananas, but there was so much hype that Josh is like, oh, I'll dive right in. And here we have a roguelike, which is one of Josh's favorite genres. Everyone is jumping in saying it's amazing. The only negative comments I can find anywhere is that the game is only about 13 hours long. And at that point, once you beat it, you're not terribly likely to go back to it. So I'm kind of curious, like, why does this not stand out to you at all, Josh? Your interest level seems to be about a zero. It's not a zero. It's like a two. You know, two. I mean, it's it, does, a it, two. Does, it does look, there's parts that look neat. Here's the problem for me, right? Is you guys know, and I know that I am completely against the grain. I am on my own island on this one, and I get that. Um, but I did not enjoy Stardew Valley. I do not like Animal Crossing. I don't like these games that focus on you just trying to work, 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 work to build like a house and then get a fence or something like that. And I'm not saying that that's what Cult of the Lamb is, but they do come out and say a large portion of this game is working on your, I guess it's a farm. We're going to call it a farm. Um, you know, it's working <laughs> your on your, yeah, because where do lambs live? They live on a farm, right? Sure. Sure. So, so you know, a lot of it is working on your farm. You have to build little buildings so that your other lamb followers can have hay to eat. And apparently they poop all over the place. So you have to go around and you have to clean up their poop and stuff like that. And I'm just like, I don't want... Like, that doesn't interest me. Now, the combat in the game looks fun. And I like the fact that you have to convert followers and, and you know, you, you, you got to, like, try to sway them to your side and stuff like that. Like, so there are parts that do look interesting to me. But all of that, I feel like, is veiled in this Stardew Valley-ish type thing where it's like, well, you could fight in Stardew Valley. Remember the mines? And I go, yeah, but that was, like, the best part of the game. And that was lame combat. So I don't know. It's missing the mark for me. I don't know why you keep saying Stardew Valley. You could not have two more different games. These are 100% different. Stardew Valley, you don't, you don't build, uh, anything regarding cult followings. This game is very <laughs> combat forward. Stardew Valley is not. Stardew Valley is about growing crops. This has nothing to do with growing crops. I don't even know why you're this talking about, about Stardew scoop, Valley it, at all. It's about scooping poop and building buildings. <laughs> right. <laughs> I feel like this, this, it just the description that both of you guys, as I've sat here and listened for the last minute, it reminds me of Stardew Valley meets uh, Rajesh Puram or whatever, that, uh, that cult in Oregon that took over like this whole town of farm, like in the 80s. It, you guys know about that, right? Anyways, I know the one you're talking about. Yeah, they have just, a it, documentary on Netflix. Yeah, so it's like it's, it's on a farm, but it has nothing to do with farming, from what I understand. It's a cult. <laughs> no. The, yeah, the, the, this game is very much like any other roguelike. You are going out on runs. They give you different tarot cards. They give you different abilities. You increase, you know, your player's power over the course of a run. And then you collect a bunch of resources. And when you die, you keep most of those resources. And then you have to have some progression, right? Like every game's got progression. Hades, you get those, you know, uh, keys or stones, whatever they were. And in between runs, you can unlock new powers. Uh, or like different increases to your character. This is exactly the same, except instead of just talking to a mirror and clicking it, you just build a statue. And then you don't run around collecting the poop from the animals on your farm. You set your followers to do it. It does have a little bit of that city management, but that's just like the format of the progression. 
It's not like you're, it's not a farm simulator by any standard. It can't be a straight farming simulator if it's only 13 hours long. It's got to have quick progression from what I think. <laughs> yeah. I will say, after trolling this game a little bit, I will say one thing that I do like is it does seem like there's three individual systems. And this is one of the things that I saw in, in, in some of the reviews is you have your combat, which they said is good and, and, and flows really, really well. Uh, it's not as good as Hades, but let's be honest, not much is in that regard. It's got your farming type thing. I, I don't want to call it a farming simulator, but whatever it is that you do on the surface with your building of houses and fences and the statues and all that stuff, right? So your Animal Crossing part. And then it's got like your converting followers to your side. And I'll be honest, it didn't go really in depth what you do with that. But anytime you have a lot of like, you know, several different systems that all work together, that generally makes for a very good game. So as much as I'm trolling this game, they say all the systems work really well together. And when that happens, I think it makes for a good game, like satisfactory, right? Like we love that game and you have a lot of different systems, exploration, construction, progression, that kind of thing. We see it with like Valheim, right? Combat, exploration, building, you know, those kinds of things. So I can see this game working really, really well. I just like trolling it because, you know, they, they mentioned Animal Crossing in the review. And so that's my hook. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, even if they said this is not like Animal Crossing, all Josh <laughs> hears is Animal Crossing, and he's just immediately out. Uh, I will say I love the idea that this game is over in 13 hours. When yeah. I was playing Hades, it hit a point that I was like, I'm getting really bored of this. I don't want a roguelike game that's going to take longer. So the idea that you can play this game and beat it in 13 hours and be done, that's kind of exactly how I want to experience that kind of game. Knock it out, finish it, you're done before it starts to get really boring. So I, I actually really like that side of it. All right. Well, let's start talking about one of the funnier stories from this week. You know, I feel like I, I feel like I'm saying this every week. We're constantly bringing up EA, but they're just so big and they're in charge of so many games. They're always making the news. We have to talk about them. Well, the big news this week is that somehow EA listed pre-orders for FIFA 23, so this is a brand new AAA title. These always sell for 60 bucks here in the States. Well, in the Epic Game Store in India, they listed it 99.98% off. By the way, the Ultimate Edition, so the highest of the different tiers. And so it was listed for a mere 4.8 rupees, which uh, I popped into Google, and Google is telling me that is six cents in America. Oh, oh man. And EA chose to honor the sales. <laughs> so all those people who bought it for six cents get to keep their pre-order FIFA 23. I mean, good good on EA. But, Michael, I'm going to give you credit on one of these because I did see where you had mentioned this. That I, I mean, l this game's got to be riddled with microtransactions. Right. I, I mean, I'm sure there's seasons and there's microtransactions and there's loot boxes and, and, you know, all the other stuff, premium passes and all that. And Michael, I think you said it that EA could have given this game away for free completely and still made a gajillion dollars off of the microtransactions that were all sure built into it. I believe I said they could have paid people to take the game and still turn to profit. This is on Twitter, by the way. I was I, I got I got I took I commandeered our Twitter account for a weekend uh, or for a little bit longer than that. And I just started like I got real upset and it was like, ah, come on. This is the dumbest thing. Like it almost seems like a publicity stunt for me. Like like it's like, oh, let's just put the story out there. They're giving it away. Blah, blah. Just to drive story because they don't care if they're selling the game for a hundred bucks. They're making hundreds and hundreds of thousands off whales in this game anyways. I was wondering how many FIFA copies they regularly sell in India. Like, I did wonder if it's low enough that it really was just a publicity stunt. In any case, EA, they owned up to it in a pretty funny way. They tweeted, we scored a pretty spectacular own goal when we inadvertently listed this at the incorrect price, blah, blah, blah. It was our mistake. We wanted to let everyone know we will be honoring all pre-purchases made at that price. But yeah, how funny. And you do know with all of those sales, they're definitely going to make all their money back plus some. Oh, yeah. I do love that my favorite part of the article, it was the very last sentence in it because they were talking about some of the features of FIFA 23 and EA and all that after this whole mix up. And the beauty of it was is that as EA was showing off FIFA 23, that in the background, there's a player doing the T-pose 
Uh-huh. Which it just means this game is as buggy as any EA game has ever made. I, I oh, mean, yeah. you know, Madden 23 <laughs> is is coming out. It's getting overwhelmingly negative reviews. I, I mean, nothing has changed <laughs> with, no. with EA and their games. Well, and I wonder if e- FIFA's got to be, if not their highest selling commodity, one of the highest. From what I understand, I mean, when you look at sports games, a lot of people play them, right? Uh, NFL football is almost exclusively North America, United States almost exclusively with a little bit of Europe because, you know, Roger Goodell's been trying to tap into that market as much as he can. Baseball is Western Hemisphere. Soccer is everywhere. Or football, you know, as the rest of the world calls it. Americans, we had to be stupid and change the name because we already had football here. But, like, I just want to see the chart overall on the microtransactions. You're probably looking at, like, USA, China, most populous. And then all of a sudden they're like, man... EA's got to find a way to convert all these rupees this year because they've got so many microtransactions in rupees from India because they probably just haven't sold a lot of games there historically. Now they have. Very well could be. Yeah. Oh, man. What what a funny little uh, story here from EA. So next up, we're going to talk a little bit about Knights of the Old Republic. Yeah. Who thought, who thought this would be back in the news already? We just talked about it. Well, was it, was it last week or two weeks it ago? It was like two, two weeks, weeks ago, ago yeah, yeah, where we all got really sad because they said, hey, KOTOR remake is, is basically dead in the water. And I yeah. think we all agreed. We were like, it's dead. Yeah. I think Michael might have even said, I have a guess that maybe next week it's going to be dead. I said, I think it's more going to be like six months and then we'll hear that it's completely canceled well we don't know exactly for sure but embracer group which keeps gobbling up all these other developers they're in the news like every week buying out someone new well they have taken over aspire which was the studio working on the kotor remake we know the remake was going horrendously where they said the quality was bad they were on pace to finish it i think they said in like 2027 or something ridiculously far in the future And so what we heard from Embracer Group is that they did say that a AAA project within their umbrella has been transitioned out of the hands of one studio to another. And so even though we don't know the exact name of the game, everyone just kind of says, based on all the games that they're looking over and what they're working on, KOTOR seems to fit the bill most likely. So it sounds like there's a pretty high chance KOTOR was taken away from Aspire and being handed over to another studio. Huzzah! Yeah. <laughs> Good news. I mean, we don't have confirmation, but everything points to that. And, and I'll be, that was great news. And honestly, credit to Michael because I'm pretty sure that Michael did say in that episode, I bet you guys in like less than four weeks that we'll be talking about Kotor being made still. I think that was pretty close to his quote. I, I, <laughs> Something like that. I, I think that I we don't need to talk about it. But I think <laughs> that if we look back, I, I'm glad we don't have anybody running statistics because our podcast isn't quite big enough to have a fan base that starts running stats off this stuff. Please don't do this ever, guys. Because I've made some bold predictions that have not worked out well. I was like, guys, there's nothing to worry about with Skull and Bones. There's nothing to yeah. worry about. I'm super <laughs> excited about it. This is going to be great. And then literally two weeks ago, I was sitting here saying, and I'll own up to this. I was like, you know what, guys? Within the next two weeks... We're going to hear that this is completely dead and it's squashed and we'll never have KOTOR. And I'm just going to sit back and be quiet for the rest of the episode. Yeah. Do you, do you guys remember ever hearing of a story like this to have a project in, develop for, in development for this long and then just handing it to a completely different studio? This seems kind of unprecedented. At least I don't remember hearing any stories like this. Yeah, I mean, I I feel like we hear stories about teams, like there's a team at a certain developer that's struggling, so they bring in another team or something like that. But to take they it completely... Add on to it. Right, yeah, exactly. To take it completely away, I mean, you got to do what you got to do, right? I, I mean, a KOTOR remake stands to make an absolute ton of money if it's done properly, and we all want to see it done properly. Um, and so in this case, if you're the parent company Embracer, and you go, listen, Aspire, you guys are you're blowing this, you know, we're, we're counting on this to be really, really good. And there's, let's be honest, this is a beloved series. So you better do this right. And Aspire's going, Oh, well, uh, and then Embracer just goes, yeah, you know what? We're going to, we're going to take that. We're just, we're going to give it to these guys over <laughs> yeah. here. Um, I, I mean, smart business move, most likely. I just, I hope that whoever they give it to uh, can get this thing on track, man. I'd like to see what happened behind the scenes. And final comment on this one for me is, I believe two weeks ago in that episode, we said, 
How hard can it be? You have a story. You have characters. You're not creating any of that. You're just making the fundamentals of the game, which you do all the time. And maybe Aspire was just trying to make it too complicated. And, uh, you know, Embracer was like, yoink, no, give it to someone who's going to put their heads on straight. Yeah, at, at least this is good news. I think we're all excited, right? We would oh, all yeah. rather hear oh, yeah. this news than it's been canceled. Uh, do you guys think Knights of the Old Republic is the best Star Wars game ever made? It's, yeah, probably. Uh, yeah, I, 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 would t- I, I was going to say, I'd put Jedi Fallen Order, like, second, right but up the there. KOTOR series is probably the best one ever made, to be honest. Oh, I put KOTOR way above Jedi Fallen Order, but I was going to say, you can't you can't wrong X-Wing versus TIE Fighter from the back of the day dogfighting <laughs> ways. <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay, if we're going that far back, then... He said ever. That means forever, I mean, Josh. Oh, like, yeah, I'm uh, saying ever. Okay. I, second place? Like X-Wing versus TIE <laughs> yeah. Fighter, KOTOR, uh, Jedi Fallen Order? Uh, Let's nice. just segment it out into two different like an you RPG <laughs> versus this dog fighting game. They're both number one in their field. Done. <laughs> yeah, for my money, KOTOR is number one. So I'm really glad to see that they're taking the remake so seriously. Because being the Star Wars name, all you got to do is pop that before any game and it's going to sell at least a million copies. But having such a treasured IP, if you got to, just wipe the slate clean. Even if they have to start over completely fresh from the ground up, I'm just glad that they're you know handling it with care. That That's all I want to see. I really want to play KOTOR again. The original, I think, is 2002. It's very yeah. rough to try to play. Yeah. So this is nothing but good news, I think, all around. All right. And then our last story of the week is a little bit of a two for one. I know sometimes our fans make fun of us for always talking about EA and Blizzard. But what are you going to do, right? They're just always in the news. So we got a little bit about the monetization of Diablo 4. And uh, I think it's safe to say Diablo 4 is going to be a deep dive, right? Oh, are we going to oh, do that one 100%. for sure? We have yes. to. Yeah. yeah, we have no choice. Yeah, And we're all very excited about but, it. But wait, Paul, by monetization, this is a, this is a PC game. I'm just going to give them my $60 and they're going to give me Diablo 4. Hey, Josh, have you ever heard of something called uh, live service gaming? <laughs> I know oh, how much you love them. <laughs> well, you know, uh, we do know that you're going to be able to buy the base game for $60. <laughs> that will be available to you. And they are going to provide seasonal content. It's going to be very similar to what was available in Diablo 3. They will have a free season pass that you can participate in, but if you pay more, you'll be able to buy the uh, seasonal pass that'll have premium content, or I'm sorry, premium rewards, and of course they are going to have an in-game cosmetics shop. Uh, I don't know that any of this is really a surprise, but it's always a little bit of a bummer to play these live service games. Dude, Blizzard is just... Uh, I, I, I'll be honest, man. I, I, I hate to sound like the grumpy old man, but hey, if that's my role, that's my role. But Blizzard is on such a steep decline for me. It's ridiculous, man. They have just gone from, hey, we want to make great video games that people love to we want to make games that make us a ton of money regardless whether people love them or not. I would... I would pay sixty dollars for Diablo Four, hands down. I, you know, without question. But now it's here's my sixty dollars. Oh, okay. Well, we're gonna do seasons. Um, and so, if you want this new season and this new character that's gonna come out, this new class that we're gonna release in this season, well, you better have that premium pass, buddy. And that's another ten bucks a month, or you know, ten dollars for three months, or however long their seasons are. Oh, and by the way, if you want to be able to do this, then you have to have this microtransaction going on, blah, blah, blah. It's like the same with Overwatch 2. When they came out and said, hey, we're going to release it for free, but Microtransaction City, it's like every game Blizzard makes is going down this road now, and I hate it. Listen, Blizzard, I'm going to make you a deal, okay? Here on the Multiplayer Gaming Podcast, we're what you call influencers, okay? So when we say things... People like to cling on to them and say, yeah, let's do that. Uh, sell me this game for four rupees and I'll spend $60 yeah. in season passes. <laughs> take, take a page out yeah. of EA's book, Blizzard. <laughs> yeah, do it. Oh, man. Yeah, you know, uh, Diablo 4, we're all looking forward to it. I think we're probably, uh, I, I don't know about Michael, but I know Josh and I played Diablo 3 together when it first released. Oh, yeah. We went through the campaign. I think I went through it twice. Yeah. I did it on like regular difficulty and then hard. I wasn't going to nightmare it or anything. 
But once I was done with the campaign twice, I was just kind of done with it and didn't go back. So this doesn't really necessarily bother me all that much because I don't plan on playing Diablo 4 for the next 10 years. I'm going to finish the campaign. I'll have a blast. If I hear one of the seasons is really good and all my friends pop into it, then I'll just play with the free seasonal pass. I'm not going to feel any, any need to give them any more money. So I don't know that it really changes a whole lot, but it just shows more and more just the mindset of squeezing every cent out of every game because it's a business. I get it. It's just sad. You know, sell me this game for $40 and give me the first year of a season pass for free and then just charge me $60. Right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you go. if you're yep. going to if you're going to do that to the gamers and say, "Listen, we're building all this content that we, is extra and that we want you to pay for over the base cost of the game, then lower the base cost of the game for me." I mean, yeah. the pro- the problem with that is they're doing this because this is exactly what they did with Diablo 3 and clearly it worked, so they're like, "We can do it again." It's almost our fault as gamers for it buying is our this, fault. and that sucks. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we joked around about Diablo Immortal and how, you know what, don't pay money for this game, don't buy into this because it's only reinforcing it. And then Blizzard comes out and says, "Hey, good news everybody, Diablo Immortal made us 100 million dollars in the first 2 months." It's insane. <laughs> kind of what our fault. What do you expect fault, them to do? Right? Kind yeah. of our fault. <laughs> 100%. Yeah, and to Blizzard's credit, it does seem like they've gotten rid of loot boxes altogether. We know that Overwatch 2 is going to be a different system, and they did say that the Diablo cosmetic shop will have specific items for sale. So at least we're no longer buying lottery tickets and hoping to get that legendary piece. You're going to be able to just see what you want, buy it, and have it. So at least that's one positive with it all. And they did confirm, of course, which we already knew, the shop will not have anything that grants a direct or indirect gameplay advantage. So it'll just be purely cosmetic, and at least you know what you're buying. So at least one little morsel of uh, credit can go to Blizzard there. (laughs) Uh, I hope that their costume shop has a cultist lamb costume I can run around with. (laughs) <laughs> be the most adorable Diablo fighter. Just ever. be careful what you wish for, Michael, because pretty soon you're gonna have Goku. John Wick I was gonna say and, you're gonna have yeah. Goku, John Wick running around in Diablo really in four, slicing and dicing. Man, <laughs> can I get a 16 bit Conan the Barbarian going? <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. I'd be for it. I, I wouldn't even be mad at that point. All right, and then the second half of the Blizzard story is that Blizzard has a still unnamed survival game that they have been working on for quite some time. It is codenamed Odyssey. We have known about it for quite a while. I don't know that we ever talked about it on Twig, but you know we have shared some stories with one another. We know all the way back in January the game was fully playable, and it seems like every single employee that has seen footage or gotten their hands on it has just absolutely gushed about the game. Um, so this one has definitely generated you know a, a certain level of hype, absolutely. And the new news this week is that there is a podcast host named Jez Corden from the Xbox Two podcast, and he has seen a lot of this game and decided to open up and talk a little bit about it. And I was curious to know what you guys think about, you know, what what we know so far about this game codenamed Odyssey. I think that realistically, uh, I'm excited about it. Uh, somewhat i mean I, it's kind of weird that we haven't seen anything as the general public on a game that's almost completely baked right because that's what i'm reading is that there's gameplay the game's it's not done but it's the bones are there i, I just can't get over the code name odyssey it seems so remarkably unoriginal and so blizzard and i know i, I shouldn't spend much time on this but it's like everything is called odyssey it's just mario just, odyssey assassin's yeah. creed odyssey uh, Elite yeah. Dangerous Odyssey. I know that's the good one, right? That's the Odyssey I think of when I think of Odyssey. But it's just like I don't know. Everyone says it looks amazing, so I'm 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 there. But I wonder how much of the hype train is you know fed by Blizzard, you know? Because everyone knows absolute hype is absolutely corruptible, right? That's a true story. And so I wonder how much of this hype is corruptive hype. That's just like, hey, Tom, it's really good because we're Blizzard and we just pay everyone to do everything anyway. So I I love a good survival game, and I'll be honest. I, other than Valheim, I don't think that there's been a survival game that's really gripped me like that game has in a while and i loved that game so when you get a very good survival game i mean satisfactory is survivalish at the same time um you know they can be incredible games man especially if you can play them with friends which i'm sure blizzard is going to you know allow in there 
And as much as I just got done trolling Blizzard, Blizzard does know how to make a great video game. And so I get real excited when I hear Blizzard survival game, you know, that it's like, wow, has Blizzard made a survival game before? Don't think that they have. You know, can, that I can do of. I trust that Blizzard can make an amazing survival game? I actually do. You know, as far as that goes. So, it, it, you know, it's one of those things where we've just not really seen it yet. I do know that in the article, one thing that was a little concerning to me is that people were saying that it basically looks like they ripped off Rare's Everwild art style. And I mm-hmm. do remember the trailer for Everwild and thinking, man, that game looks really, really nice. So I don't know what the truth of that is. The only other thing that concerned me a little bit is when this guy was talking about this Project Odyssey he said that in terms of gameplay, it reminded him of Fallout 76. And that's when I went, oh, no. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's not a good comparison. <laughs> no. And that's and on that point, like, it, it took it in, like, nine different directions in this article. It said, okay, it looks and feels like Fallout 76. It's not an MMO, but you're going to be able to trade with other players. Also, it looks like Everwild. Also, it's steampunk, but you're going to use a bow and arrow. And I'm like, what is, what is this? I'm so confused at this point. Yeah, and I think people who have been able to play it or see it have only seen small chunks so i like i listened to this whole chunk within this podcast and everything that the guy was saying was meant to be highly complimentary but he was a little all over the place in what he was comparing it to he does even joke when he says now i know when i say this it's gonna throw people off but it does remind me of fallout 76 but it was more so all the promises of what Fallout 76 was supposed to be. Oh, we know how that went. And, <laughs> and, and Right. And we know that supposedly they fixed it, but they burned me and Josh so, so bad, we said, we'll never go back. We will never try Fallout no. 76 again. But um, as far as the art style, Everwild is already kind of close to what we know from Blizzard anyway. If you see World of Warcraft, where it's got you know the bright fantasy colors... I, I, that didn't surprise me at all, but I love the idea of Blizzard making a survival game, you know, with how much we love Rust. Rust is a hundred percent rooted in a real life setting where nothing is fantastical or magical or over the top. It's very much, I'm going to run around and I'm going to, you know, hit this cactus with an axe and I'm going to get some cactus water out of it, you know, or whatever. The idea of Blizzard coming in and maybe giving us something that is Rust-like, but giving us the ability to use magic. They said it's a fairy tale setting. The guy, again, compared it to Fable. He said it kind of has that Fable-like feel. That's where you really are talking my language, and I really hope that this one pans you're, out. You're talking my language now, Paul. I'm getting kind of hot and bothered here. Because <laughs> you give, give me a survival game like Rust, but in a fantasy setting? Oh, baby. You can understand the potential, right? Yes. I feel yeah. like that's got high risk, high reward. If it lands, I think it's going to be an enormous success. It's Blizzard. It, it's going to yes. land. That's the thing, man. Like, it's Blizzard. It should. They, yeah. I, I mean, I, I can't yeah. see Blizzard making a flop, you know, as, as far as that goes. No, don't get me wrong. They're going to charge us for every sip of water we want to take in that game, you know, through microtransactions and stuff. But... It's Blizzard. They're gonna they're gonna nail it. Like I have no doubt that they will in that regard. I mean that that is the one thing we do know about Blizzard. Aside from you know, aside from all the negative, because we 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 tend to focus on the negative when it comes to Blizzard. It's, it's hard not to. They've made a lot of missteps when it comes to their financials, but at the same point, like they make really good games. And the hype train says this is a good game, and we know Blizzard makes good games, so it's probably going to be good. And I want to play it. Even with the lukewarm reception I gave it a minute ago. <laughs> There's always something to every Blizzard game that you can hang on to and and is fun. Anthem, enormously fun. You just run out of content too fast. Overwatch, this huge new standard with uh, arena hero shooters and the esports. Anything they come out with definitely does something right, at least for a while. Whether or not the game has long-term legs, I think that'll remain to be seen but I think without a doubt, the first couple hours of this game are probably going to be pretty fantastic. Yeah. I, I'd pretty much bet my money on it. All right. Well, that is all the news that we had here to cover for this week. Hope you guys enjoyed hearing it all. Come hit us up on social media. You know, Michael, for the most part, is the one who handles our Twitter and Instagram. We would love to hear from you guys there. We would love to get suggestions for the show. You can also join our free Discord server. Just check out the link in the episode description. 
And as far as upcoming episodes, we will have a quick take on Saturday, and then we will be back for a bonus round on Monday. And the next deep dive that we have scheduled, have we even announced the name on the show? I, maybe it's time if we I haven't. Don't, I, I don't, think, I don't we think we have. have. All right, you want to tell the people, Josh, what are we covering? We are playing a game that I never played before, which is goofy, (laughs) because if you had asked me a couple weeks ago, I'd have been like, oh, yeah, that game's great. But then I realized I somehow I'd never played this game, and that is Fallout New Vegas, chosen by legendary supporter Glap Sidier, you know, awesome member of the community, longtime listener of the show. Um, and so we are right in the, the heart of playing that. Um, and it's going to make for a great episode. I can tell you that. Yeah. We're gonna have to talk a whole hour about how to mod the game just to play it in 2022. (laughs) So if you, (laughs) if you want to go ahead and spend some time in fallout new Vegas, we can't wait to talk about that for the next deep dive. And I think that's all that we got here for today. So we will see you guys next time. Happy gaming all. Thanks everybody. Cheers. All right. See you everybody.